From the tiniest particles to the most powerful forces, our world is deeply intertwined with the very small world of atomic physics. But how do forces within some of the smallest objects in the universe give rise to the single most destructive weapons on our planet? Today's video is the first part of a two-part series where we'll be diving deep into the heart of matter and exploring the very building blocks that went into developing the atom bomb. This first part will lay the foundational groundwork for unraveling the mysteries of atoms, their structures, some subtleties hidden within the periodic table, and all the terminology you'll need to know in order to understand atomic physics. Understanding these concepts is crucial for pushing further into the second part of this series covering what makes nuclear weapons tick. And even if you're an atomic mastermind, this still will be worth your while. Hopefully. So without further ado, let's get started in three, two, one. Atoms are the most basic building blocks of matter around us. From ice cream to icebergs, everything at the end of the day is simply atoms and combinations of different types of atoms. There are 118 different types of atoms, with each type being referred to as an element on the periodic table. What distinguishes one type of atom from another? That's a loaded question, but let's take a look. But before we do, make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit that like button. To understand this, we first need to take a look at the general structure of an atom. I realize this isn't the first time you've seen an atomic diagram, but there are some important details here that we'll build upon later, so pay close attention. Each atom consists of a central core region referred to as the nucleus. The nucleus is orbited by negatively charged particles known as electrons. This model of the atom, known as the Bohr model, was established in 1913 by, you guessed it, Niels Bohr, and is how the atom is most depicted in society today. The picture of electrons orbiting the nucleus in nice circular orbits is actually overly simplistic, but for most intents and purposes, good enough. And in case you haven't already pieced things together, nuclear weapons didn't derive their name from an atom's electrons. It came from an atom's nucleus. Over 99.9% .9 of an atom's mass is contained within the nucleus. And as we'll soon see, the mass of an atom is the crucial piece of a nuclear bomb. The nucleus contains two types of particles, positively charged protons and zero charged neutrons. The charge of a proton is exactly equal and opposite to that of an electron, but surprisingly, a proton is much more massive. 1,836 times more massive to be exact. Neutrons and protons on the other hand have approximately the same mass, with a neutron having just over 0.1% more mass than a proton. This being said, a proton's mass is still incredibly tiny being around 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So, instead of constantly referring to this tiny mass in kilograms, physicists and chemists use an alternative unit for atomic masses, referred to as the AMU, or atomic mass unit. A proton has a mass of 1.007 AMU. And while most of the mass resides within the atomic nucleus, its protons and neutrons are confined within a very tight space. For hydrogen, the nucleus has a diameter of only 1.7 femtometers. That's 10 to the minus 15 meters. The orbiting electron around the nucleus, on the other hand, extends to over 60,000 times this distance, bringing the total atomic diameter to 1.06 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 1.06 angstroms. For some perspective, this then means that the atomic nucleus only occupies around 4 times 10 to the minus 13 percent of the entire atomic volume. Or put it another way, let's say the nucleus of an atom is the size of a standard baseball, and we place it on the second base of, let's say, Dodger Stadium.
the electron orbit around our baseball nucleus would look something like this. The electron orbit would extend way past the stadium and have a diameter of 4.6 kilometers, or just under three miles. Yes, all matter around us is mostly empty space. So back to our original question. What's the defining feature for an element? Is it the number of protons, electrons, or neutrons? Each can vary, but the short answer is the number of protons define an element. Here's why. For neutral atoms, the number of protons and electrons within an atom must be equal, since the negative and positive charges must cancel out. So the more protons, the more electrons a neutral atom will acquire. However, since electrons are lighter and much more spatially extended, the number of electrons of an atom can change depending on many environmental factors, such as atomic bonding to other atoms, oxidation, reduction, etc. How about the neutrons? It turns out the number of neutrons in an atomic nucleus can also vary, but since they are neutral in nature, they have little influence over the electronic configuration of an atom. Hence, the number of protons within an atom's nucleus is the defining trait of an element. This number is referred to as the atomic number. And on a periodic table, this number is often displayed above each element's symbolic name. You may also notice a second number listed below an element's symbol. Depending on the element listing, this can be one of two quantities. If the number is a nice, tidy integer, then this number is referred to as the mass number of the element, which is an element's total number of neutrons and protons summed together. Most elements, however, list the actual mass of the atom in units of AMU, and this is referred to as the atomic mass. How do you determine the actual mass of an atom? You can't just plop it on a scale and weigh it. These values are determined experimentally, usually using a technique known as mass spectrometry. In this technique, atoms are vaporized into a gas, then stripped of their electrons using an ionizing beam of electrons. Then, the ionized atoms are accelerated by an electric field directed towards a magnet. Once the moving charges enter the magnetic field, the magnetic force deflects the charges from their straight motion path. You can use Newton's second law to find that the radius of curvature from the original beam path is proportional to the mass of each atom. The minute details of this aren't entirely important, and we can leave it at that for now. The important thing to note is that the atomic mass is an experimentally determined value. However, there is a catch, and actually, several catches. First, as I mentioned before, the number of neutrons within an atom's nucleus can vary. Two or more versions of the same element with different neutron numbers are called isotopes. To distinguish between an element's various isotopes, the common naming convention is to specify the element's symbol followed by the isotope's mass number. For instance, the element uranium has the atomic symbol U and has an atomic number of 92. The three most common isotopes of uranium on Earth contain either 146, 143, or 142 neutrons. Hence, they would be named as U-238, U-235, and U-234. For illustrative purposes, we'll be referencing uranium often throughout this video series because, spoiler alert, it's what's used in nuclear weapons. We'll certainly see why that's the case as we proceed onward, but for now, it's along for the ride. Now, as you can imagine, the masses of an element's isotopes are slightly different due to the differences in neutron number. But the periodic table just lists one atomic mass value. The listed number on a periodic table is actually a mass average of all of an element's isotopes, weighted by natural abundance. So for the case of uranium, over 99% of all naturally occurring uranium is U-238, which has an atomic mass of just over 238 AMU. This leaves under 1% of naturally occurring uranium split between U-235 and U-234 with 0.72% being U-235 and only 0.0054% being U-234. Hence, the atomic mass of uranium, as listed on the periodic table, is simply the weighted average of these isotope mass values, which equates to 238.03 AMU. 
You may think I'm being a little pedantic about all this atomic mass stuff, but the devil is in the details. Up until this point, this nice picture of an atom is likely the same picture you learned and accepted in most standard science courses. But if you think about it, there's something funny about this picture. First, the nucleus contains a bunch of positively charged protons in a tightly enclosed space. And even from elementary school science class, we all learn that light charges repel, right? So what brings all of these charges together and prevents every atom in the universe from splitting apart? If you think gravity might be keeping everything together, we can make a quick comparison between the attractive gravitational force versus the repulsive electrostatic force between two protons, let's say in an atomic nucleus. This back of a napkin calculation reveals the repulsive force between two protons is approximately one with 36 zeros times stronger than the attractive force of gravity. So gravity is definitely not responsible for keeping atoms together. Another funny thing, if we know the mass of an individual proton, the mass of an individual neutron, and the mass of an individual electron, shouldn't the total mass of an atom just equal all of the individual masses of its constituent particles? For instance, shouldn't the atomic mass of U-238 just be equal to 92 times a proton's mass plus 146 times a neutron mass plus 92 times an electron mass? I'll leave this as an exercise to the viewer, but let me know what you find in the comments below. Does it equal U-238's atomic mass? I'll be addressing these questions in the next video, but their answers run deep and are ultimately what enabled the creation of the atomic bomb. So if you want to catch that video, make sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on the next episode. But for now, you'll have the foundational building blocks for moving forward and we'll see exactly how the nucleus is exploited for harnessing nuclear energy next time. I'm Dr. John, and until then, happy learning.